Hi, as Diane said, we're, uh, we're from GE Digital, um, and we're here to talk a little bit about our journey uh, to OpenShift, um, what we've experienced along the way, and uh, kind of maybe some, some helpful uh, discourse about maybe you can help us and we can help you, uh, and we can help them uh, make the product better. So uh, without further ado, um, I'll introduce Tim Oliver. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tim Oliver, software engineer at GE. Um, I am, well, I get more into what I'm doing later, but, but I'm a software developer at GE. <laughs> I'm just going to get mine out of the way now. So, um, I actually have the same title as Tim, but I am a sysadmin by trade. I was a, um, I've been at GE for eight years. Uh, I was a Solaris admin for almost 20 years, and I came to GE as a Solaris virtualization Solaris. engineer, containers, <laughs> before containers, before <laughs> containers, and um, I did automation as a service for about five years at GE, and then I joined the container uh, cloud service, and I do all the terraform -y stuff that happens before we do our OpenShift install. So, although I am really excited about four, <laughs> now I, I don't have a job anymore. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later and, and why we're excited about that. I think, uh, I think they're augmenting us all out of jobs, which is Wherever good. you are. Thank you, Clayton. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my name's Jay Ryan. I'm a, a staff infrastructure architect at GE. I'm not sure what that means, but you know how titles go. Um, so, I've been working uh, at GE for just two years, and I've been working with containers and Kubernetes since March. Uh, so I'm very new to this space and uh, excited um, to be a part of it. So um, a little bit about our team. Um, GE is a complex organization, and so we, uh, we sit on uh, what we call the Container Cloud team. Uh, it's a very small team. We're half of the team here um, today, uh, represented here. And we're dedicated to running Kubernetes as a service at GE. Um, and so we sit uh, in our core tech division, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but that's basically IT as a service for all of GE and the GE business units. Tim's going to talk a little bit about what GE is and what we do besides appliances and light bulbs, which I'm sure you'd probably raise your hands for. So one of the things that's really cool about GE and about working for GE, I've been at GE since 95. So Yes, these grays tell a story. <laughs> the, um, but GE is a huge company, and we're all over the world. I mean, take that globe and stretch it out, and that's where we are. Pick a country, and we'll probably be there, have a presence. So GE is the kind of company that builds the things that make things like cities work. We do the power plants, and we do the oil and gas, and we do the, the uh, power, uh, renewable power, and things like that. It's all the kind of stuff that's behind the scenes, but it's huge. It's industrial stuff. And then there was also the light bulbs and the uh, home appliances and things like that that is now no longer a part of us, but that's another story. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're all over the world, and we're in a lot of different businesses. Uh, we're in healthcare. We're in, uh, we do things with the, obviously the Department of Defense, we're in aviation, we uh, make engines and things like that. So in some of our businesses, it's really highly regulated. And then in other things, it's, it's what you would think about as IT. <clears throat> so it's, it's pretty cool. The, back in probably about 2010, we're dealing with a lot of things that you probably have heard as an enterprise. Uh, every developer, every developer team thinks that their application is special and requires their own server. And so you go and buy that hardware, it comes in, it sits on the dock, and then it's underutilized because their app is the only thing that's using it. Uh, but then at the same time, they're complaining about compute costs. Oh, and everything costs too much. It just costs too much. You gotta lower the cost. And so I was part of a team that was a part of our initial entry into the cloud. And we're looking at these things and we're trying to just get the cost down. So we're looking at all these apps and we're looking at all these underutilized servers and all of this. And we're thinking, how can we do this better? Well, along comes Docker and containers. And it seemed like the perfect solution. <clears throat> but then we have, um, you know, we, get a, we, had a, we had some changes. If you've been watching any of the Wall Street stuff, we've had some changes in the way GE operates. We won't go into that. <laughs> but there's been changes in management levels and things like that, right? So uh, some of our initial efforts got thwarted 
But we started down the Docker road with Docker Swarm, and we had some successes with that. And then we started with some of the other technologies, and we had some successes. Uh, we found ourselves actually developing the pieces around Kubernetes, because Kubernetes, particularly in the earlier days, Kubernetes is a bear to install. It was just huge, and it was unwieldy, and, and it, it really took something to install that thing and to, to keep it running right. Uh, but we were building services around that, and then we saw OpenShift. And OpenShift, everything that we were trying to build, OpenShift had. So what we were doing didn't make any sense anymore. <laughs> so then it was like, well, okay, how do we just, if, they're, if they already have it, then why are we building this? We can just get it from them. And then, of course, Red Hat does all of the great stuff that, as an enterprise, you need with the support and everything like that. So we got down the road of containers. We had a lot of false starts, uh, but we had a lot of opportunities for containers. And then uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes happened, and we got started with that. So, so, uh, so yeah, so uh, if we take a step back a little bit and t talk to you a little bit about core tech, about uh, IT as a service at GE and how that works, it will kind of make sense uh, uh, about why we approached OpenShift the way that we did. So um, half a million people uh, Cortec is supporting in over 170 countries, uh, 7,000 enterprise applications, and as Tim mentioned, migration to the cloud, app modernization. 300,000 uh, employees all over the world. Right. Over 10,000 applications, actually. Yeah. So 1,000 uh, plus, that's, I think that's old data, probably 1,000 plus applications migrated. So uh, as Tim said, we're, we're around the globe. So one of the things that makes Cortex special uh, is that we're really a business partner. We're partnering with our business units together to help, uh, to help them migrate to the cloud, to help them optimize their applications. Um, and we really do that through like a product-centric approach. So we are a service provider for uh, GE. And so if we're not successful, GE is not successful. So one of the things that we focus on as a product organization is building products for the customer, not bringing IT services that they have to consume. So I, that approach kind of flips things on its head. And so if, if we... Um, if we are successful, GE can be successful too. So one of the things that, that I'm doing actually is taking OpenShift and writing a layer around it that is specific to a self-service kind of a model that we want our users to use. And I'm using calling, making calls to the OpenShift API in order to do things like create accounts and assign groups and roles and all that to users and groups and things like that. We're handling that metadata side of it outside and that's the piece that I'm writing around, around OpenShift. So uh, OpenShift at GE. So we took, uh, like I said, uh, Cortec takes a product-centric approach. So we kind of took a product-centric approach when uh, approaching OpenShift. And so as you heard already this morning, uh, the reasons why OpenShift. OpenShift checked all of those boxes out of, out of the gate for us. Kubernetes the hard way is a hard way, right? Um, <laughs> So, and now OpenShift, uh, what we find out that in OpenShift 3, that was OpenShift the hard way. Um, and as, as, Clayton, as uh, Clayton and Derek stated, right, they're making things a whole lot easier for us going forward. So they're checking those boxes. They're a, a, a step in front of us the whole way, and that, that just excites us. So when we have conversations with our security teams, we can, uh, we can tell them that, you know, we're bringing secure platform out of the box uh, to start with. Um, a little bit about um, kind of the background that Tim uh, mentioned, uh, 10,000, when, when we did a small survey, a small sampling of, of what our customers were doing with regards to containers and orchestration, um, we found some uh, moderately surprising numbers, but we found tens of thousands of containers running. Um, we found thousands of Docker daemons. And around 100 or so orchestration engines. And so that was, like I said, just a small sampling. That was maybe a 20 or 30% sampling of the environment uh, that we had access to, to dive into. So we saw our customers with a need. Um, and, and again, with the product-centric approach, right? we're going to build a product to help them solve that need because Kubernetes is hard to operate. Um, when, we did, when we surveyed some of these customers, um, 
the what was what was the what was the what was the main thing? It's like, hey, you guys are running Kubernetes. How's it working out for you? Yeah, and all of them, without without fail, just about everyone that we talked to. So here, just to back up a little bit, uh, they started doing Kubernetes or Docker or whatever the container strategy was. They started doing it on their own because we didn't have a corporate service offering for them. So it started happening at a lower level. But when they heard that we were doing OpenShift, not every one of them said. Um, great, because I don't want to run this. I don't want to run OpenShift. I want somebody else to do it. I just want to consume it, which made our job a lot easier because we actually had a built-in market at that point. Yep. So uh, that's when we implemented our Kubernetes as a service model. And so what that really is um, is a fully automated and orchestrated lifecycle for OpenShift. And that's today that's built on AWS um, with more clouds to come in the future. Um, we're using persistent storage. We're using EBS uh, dynamic uh, volumes as well as uh, experimenting with cluster uh, dynamic storage in AWS as well. Um, we don't have pretty pictures to show you about all of our cool archi uh, architecture because it's OpenShift's architecture. And again, one of the things that made this such a great choice was they, you know, they lay out reference architecture. They tell you how this should work in production. And so we followed their model with you know, uh, high available masters, uh, at CD and infra, infra. Uh, we're using four node OCS clusters for Gluster. Um, some of the guidance was three nodes so uh, in the past. So four nodes will actually give you the ability to uh, provision storage uh, while, you're, while you're patching uh, the cluster. So and one of the things about this is that really, I mean, orchestration is not sexy. It's just running, it's just running containers. But that's exactly what you want. You don't want it to be out there visible saying, hey, here I am running containers. You just want it back there doing the job. And yeah. that's what we've seen so far. It's been up and our users are using it and it just, the thing just goes. Yep. So we, we started with the before. internal registry, um, which is fitting most of our needs, actually. We also have some registries that are part of some of the other work that, that some teams were doing um, that we're plugging those in as well. Um, we, we've set a, a standard that, that says um, for a registry to be uh, you know, whitelisted in, in our environment, it's going to have to check these security boxes, scanning, um, and, and the like. So we're also on the internal platform. We're also running Claire, as I'm sure many of you guys are, to, to do scanning and vulnerability checks. Um, and we're working on automating the life cycle around um, uh, detect and remediation. One of the guys that's back home that didn't come uh, sent us a Claire report today that he was doing some scanning. And the very containers that I'm using to run that, what I just told you about around the API, has 50 vulnerabilities. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as I mentioned, we're a product-based product organization. So we have three flavors, uh, so to speak, of, our, of the product that we're offering at GE. Um, one is the, the, one, uh, the first one is shared clusters. Um, and so Chris, uh, Red Hat CTO, uh, sorry, the um, OpenShift CTO, came up here and talked earlier about you know, either building mega clusters or building lots of little clusters. And if we would have had a conversation with him about six months ago, we probably would have went the lots of little clusters right uh, way, which we were kind of going uh, down that path. Now, it turned out a lot of our customers have workloads that require, um, that require their, own, their own clusters. So as Tim mentioned, lots of, uh, lots of government, lots of regulation. Uh, if there's a three-letter acronym, it, it exists at, at GE. So. Um, so yeah, so we have three types. We have shared clusters, basically for test and dev type workloads, where you can come and play, you can learn OpenShift, you can bring your test workloads to get it working, and then um, we're offering dedicated nodes um, in that environment. So for customers that maybe need that next step, that say, hey, I don't, I don't want, um, I don't want customer Y from business unit X um, being able to affect my um, uh, availability. Uh, they can run their own nodes on that same platform. And then uh, dedicated clusters is ultimately the, the kind of route that we're doing. And so the way, that, the way that we're really doing this is through um, um, automating the life cycle of the clusters. So uh, from soup to nuts, we can stand up clusters, install them, patch them. Um, in, in the way that, that uh, Clayton and, and Derek were, were talking about for the, for the next version. So it, it's, it's great to hear that because uh, thank you, Clayton and Derek, for automating us out of jobs. I really appreciate that. And I actually say that very sincerely because what we need to focus on 
and what Clayton, I think, mentioned several times is we need to focus on like driving business value, right? And the less time we're spending getting the cluster running and, and, uh, and automating the cluster, the more time that, that we get to spend solving business problems. The less time we spend with, with development teams, app development teams, talking about infrastructure and servers and things like that, when really all they're trying to get to is, I want to run my application, and I want to run it with all the capacity that I need, and I want it to scale, and I want it to be up all the time. When we can have that conversation and we obfuscate the infrastructure, then we're winning. Uh, so one of the, uh, Tim talked about some of the work that he's doing, but one of the things that we're building is uh, what we call project guardrails, which are basically uh, constructs using resources and uh, limits, taints, and tolerations to give our customers uh, the ability to, to stand up the workloads that they want, but also give them constraints that they might want to put in place, like potentially cost constraints or something like that, um, and, and tenancy constraints. So. We give them the ability to uh, to build the uh, to build their clusters and their projects in, in the way that makes sense, business sense for them. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities that we have um, to make the product better, to make our offering better. Um, and I'll, I'm kind of going to breeze through these a little bit. Um, I know we're running out of time, and uh, I appreciate everybody. Uh, um, I appreciate everybody. Clayton and today. those guys already told us so if we need more time, we we gotta we can have we their pattern. we can have their time back. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, our back. Uh, one of the things at GE is we have really complex teams, uh, teams that span different organizations. You know, dotted line teams. And so when we want to build, when our customers want to build our back models and our back controls inside their projects, um, it can get uh, a little messy. And so one of the things that we want to do is build out. Um, custom RBAC roles that can uh, take away, you know, certain certain access and um, uh, just enable our teams to work better. And I, those are things that that I think are might help the community as well. Um, there are default RBAC roles that come with the cluster, and of course, you know, you can change RBAC to your heart's content. But that's something that I think, you know, maybe a set of practices around um, um, that that we're, we're looking to. Um, to help with, I guess. Um, identity as well. So open ID um, is what we use uh, in the cluster. And we, um, uh, the user info endpoints in open ID aren't necessarily supported yet in OpenShift. And so there's lots of balls in the air to, to get all of our, uh, our identity matched up and synced up. Um, throughout uh, throughout G in the cluster, so that's one of the things that that we're working on too, and that's uh, something that Tim's working on as a part of um, as a part of uh, his his front end. Yeah, a tenancy is a thing that is starting to get talked about, I guess, in the community. This one is big. Um, we're we're really interested in um, in the working group uh, multi tenancy um, that the Kubernetes uh, community has. Um, we're building business constructs and tenant constructs outside of the platform today, um, and using the product, the project tenancy um, that that's exists today. Um, but I, we think there's a, a bigger story around that, that that we're following as well. In each of our businesses, they're all pretty discrete businesses. The thing that they have in common is that they are GE, but then it pretty much stops there. So the, the shared hardware and shared platforms and things like that, we really need the isolation because nobody wants to deal with it or, or even they don't want to deal with anybody else. They want to be the only ones. Uh, ingress, uh, again, we have application teams that have complex needs. And so uh, OpenShift has routes and Kubernetes has ingress and those things are coming together. Um, so we're interested in that story and how that, how that evolves and uh, how we can support you know, complex uh, ingress uh, policies in, in the cluster. So uh, the future for us is basically just listen to what the guys talked about this morning, because that's the stuff that we're excited about. We're Red Hat 4, <laughs> OpenShift 4, um, that we're, is the thing. Yeah. We're expanding. I said we're in AWS today. We're expanding to, uh, to the other clouds that we're in. We're in all of them. Uh, we do OpenStack as well. Um, so. Uh, in January and Q1 next year, we'll be rolling out our OpenStack uh, on-premise um, OpenShift deployments and uh, looking forward to more clouds uh, in the future as well. Um, ephemeral build environment. So one of the things around build is 
uh, it requires privilege. So we want to build, we've talked to the OpenShift dedicated team a little bit, and they've talked to us about how they're doing that. And uh, it's, it's very interesting. So they build physical hardware and tear it down uh, every time they do build. So uh, I don't think we're going to get quite there, but an ephemeral build story is definitely in the cards. So um, CoreOS and Cryo, no, no further explanation needed there why we're going in that direction. And the biggest thing for, for us is our customers are innovating. GE is innovating. GE has always been innovating. So uh, the customers that we have in the environment today are teaching us about Kubernetes and teaching us about OpenShift and asking about operators and asking about Helm and, and wanting to know how they can get in at the ground floor and build their applications and their platforms on top of OpenShift and integrate and build them in a, in a cloud native way. So that's, that's one of the most exciting things for me. Yes, we're, we're, getting, the, we're getting the watch. So, um, and we're hiring. <laughs> yeah, we really appreciate all your time today. And if you want to talk about multi-tenancy um, or any of the other kind of futures or challenges we're interested in, uh, come find us. Thank you. And we're hiring. <laughs> <laughs>